Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Ben and this is Vision and Light. This week I'm speaking with Sarah Marino and I have to say it's been one of the most enjoyable and uh, stimulating conversations that we had and it's starting to form a path that we're going to go down where Vision and Light is synonymous with us as humans, us as individuals, us in the landscape finding solace and peace and quiet and harmony uh, and a way to cure uh, the noise that's in the world and the distractions that kind of stop us from realizing our full potential. So Sarah was incredibly insightful. The conversation, like I said, was so stimulating and it was just such a pleasure to talk with her. I've been a huge fan of her work, as has Anne-Christine, for a number of years now. And it's great to see her moving forward into this corporate life as a landscape photographer, sharing her vision, sharing her passion, and having a quiet voice that makes a loud noise. So thank you very much for listening to this episode of Vision and Light, where I have the greatest pleasure talking with Colorado's very own Sarah Marino. Sarah, how are you? Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's great to talk with you today, Alistair. Thanks so much for having me on. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, it's been a long time coming, this. I think it's uh, we've had so many other commitments with Out of Chicago, and then we did some webinars for Nature Photographers Network, um, and it was a case of trying to schedule in. But I think we've been talking about this for about a month or six weeks mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be here. It Good. seems like every day is almost the same, so... <laughs> What, with with being locked down or, or on webinars? Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Yes, it's, uh, I mean, I'm very grateful, actually, of the opportunity to be able to have these conversations because uh, one of the things that's been a big factor of my life has been isolation from communities. Uh, I'm here in the west of Scotland, and um, before that, I was 15 years in China. And something you were talking about on the... Um, the podcast that you were on with Matt Payne and uh, a bunch of amazing uh, photographers last night was talking about um, the ability for networking and collaborations and things like that. Do you think that this current uh, situation is actually helping us to expand our collaborations across the globe rather than just in our little small niches or niches, as you guys say? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think that at least for my own photography, not so much my creative side, but the business side, I think this experience has forced me to do some things that I was totally uncomfortable with before. Like if you had asked me three months ago if I would do a video interview with you, I would have said absolutely not. <laughs> like okay. I, not, I don't do video. Um, so I think in that sense, just forcing me to try some different things, partnering up with people on um, I've been offering webinars with some colleagues and so partnering more closely with those people that it's it's because we're all not traveling at the same pace that it's been a great opportunity to slow down and take a pause yeah. and say, like what could I do differently both in terms of creativity and in terms of business and networking so I actually, I do think I would agree with what you had to say about like this has increased the opportunity to connect with people. In it a certainly way. has for me. It's been incredible. I mean, because you know we live quite remotely on the west of Scotland, and most of my friends are in the states and Canada, uh, so we never get to talk with each other. Really, it's it's quite a rare event. So yeah, I'm I'm loving it. It's uh, <laughs> it's actually it's actually been great for for the business really in many ways. Now I know that you just turned full time professional money making landscape photographer back in January. Uh, now. Obviously, initially, the thought of that was that the timing was going to be awful, you know, with, with all of a sudden, you know, everything that you would have had planned for this year, I guess, has gone up in smoke to a certain extent. Do you feel differently now that we're maybe three months in and you've seen the, the way that the business can be developed in an online capacity? And do you think that's going to change how you move forward now? I actually think it probably will, because I think when I envision what my ideal life looks like, I would actually rather be doing the kinds of things that I'm doing now. 
right. um, just because like my husband, Ron Coscarosa and I uh, were both nature photographers and we've tried to design our lives really intentionally. So we moved to a tiny town in rural Southwestern Colorado and we live in a place with, with, like, the, with surroundings that really inspire us. Uh, so I think I would rather be able to have the flexibility to continue living that more intentional life than always traveling to exotic places, a, a lot of the same places over and over for workshops. So I think the, like I said in the previous part of our discussion, like uh, that forcing me to do some things I hadn't done before, I think is a huge benefit. Right. And obviously, I think the your involvement with Nature First and the principles of responsible landscape photography you know, the big conflict that all of us, I think, have always had is the amount of traveling that we do, the, the, you know, taking people to iconic places, glorifying the landscape, all of that type of thing. And the thing that's been most kind of soul searching for me is that the way we're operating our businesses now is actually far better mm -hmm. uh, on a global climate change scenario and our, our, our footprint, our carbon footprint. So I'm just wondering if, if this might be a transition into some different way that we can actually run our business. It's, I think it's, a, it's something that I've been thinking about for myself, just in terms of like, there's so much content right now. Mm. Like, is it, are people, because people seem to be absorbing a lot of it. Uh, but uh, so many people are doing interviews and podcasts and YouTube channels and edu e educational eBooks and video tutorials. Like, is there enough of a market to absorb all of us switching from in-person workshops to online learning? Uh, so I think I've found that the response has been really positive to what I've been doing, but I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that it's sustainable with so many people turning towards doing some pretty similar things. Do you think like, we need to start like a Hunger Games type of thing? <laughs> <laughs> that only the, the fittest survives. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. The most subscribers survives. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to use that as a parameter. Otherwise, I'm so screwed. <laughs> yeah, I'll be going back to consulting like tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We can't, we can't have popularity as a benchmark for, for the quality of our work. Otherwise, we, we, uh, we're sending the wrong message, I'm sure. <laughs> um, now... What I am very interested in listening to is, you know, you will have heard some of the conversations I've had with people like Guy Tal, uh, Mark Adamus, and Theo Bosboom. And I'm very interested in our emotional spectrum and how that impacts our creativity. Now, do you feel that your images are, what, what, what is the spectrum of their, their articulation? What, what are your images saying about what you photograph, why you photograph it, and who you are as a photographer? Uh, well, I think to start that I have two sides. I have a, a really, uh, with my black and white work, it's very bold, very aggressive, str much stronger uh, dynamic compositions. And then I feel like in my color work, I gravitate much more to the quieter side of nature, uh, harmony, order, and some of those qualities. And I think that in some ways, describes my personality. Like I like downtime and, and solitude and quiet. And then I also sometimes really enjoy those ex super intense experiences out in nature uh, so that I'm able to find both, both of those things in my work. Uh, but generally, I think the, the bottom line is that I have an incredibly busy mind. I, I know that you've talked about mental health and, uh, mm. and, the, some of the related aspects to creativity and art with some of the other people that you've talked with. And as I had previous, previously mentioned to you, that really resonated with me uh, because my mind just goes nonstop and constantly busy, constantly ruminating, constantly assessing and analyzing. And the one time where I can find some peace is with nature photography. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the reasons that I gravitate so much to order and harmony and grace and elegance in compositions is because it's a way for me to find that with my mind. Like being in a state of complete focus out in nature where all I'm thinking about is the beauty and interesting, fascinating things that are surrounding me, I'm able to put to bed all of the, the, the normal busy state of my mind. Mm. So that it's, for me, it's one of those, those few times where I'm able to really relax and feel at peace 
Uh, so I feel like that's probably the dominant thing that's reflected in my photography. Is that appreciation? I I feel very honoured to be able to have these conversations, you know, having the one with Guy in particular. I mean, I've known Guy for a number of years and, and know his struggles with, with his own mental health. My own situation uh, has been the same, kind of like you, sort of wracked with anxiety and panic attacks and fear for a good chunk of my adult life. And photography for me was always the, the path out. It, it was always that way, like you say, of engaging with something else rather than this idiot that lives <laughs> in your head. And um, so in terms of the type of images that you make, do you feel that the, the, the who you are when you go into the landscape? So the version of yourself that goes into the landscape, is there a conscious um, awareness of that at the time of you being in the landscape and therefore are you kind of conscious of the type of images that you're being drawn to or is the whole thing kind of innate and unconscious and, and a much more fluid and it's in retrospect in hindsight that you get to look at the images and think ah right so that's the Sarah that was in there <laughs> last week. Uh, no I think it I think it's incredibly intuitive that I'm just drawn to particular types of scenery uh, since I am married to a nature photographer and we often go out together, I see how we react to different things differently, like how he'll frame up a scene or see something entirely different. And I think he's better at dealing with imperfections and, ex and his compositions, I think he accepts chaos and a, a lot more complexity. Whereas if we if I'll come back from the same scene, I'm definitely focusing more on simplicity and exclusion and harmony. Uh, so I think just having that little test always following me around because we're always, we aren't photographing the same thing, but we're going to right. the same places together. That I feel like I'm just naturally drawn to those things that like that I was describing around simplicity and elegance and grace and quietness with the exception of those times where it's just like crazy intense experience like a sandstorm on sand dunes and it's like this sure. is amazing and I'm I'm going to go with it uh, but if I'm just out wandering around and seeing what I'm going to see I'm definitely just innately drawn to order and simplicity yeah I think that, I mean your your work is I think the word harmonious is absolutely perfect I mean it, it's uh your understanding of color, um, I think, is particularly impressive, and and there, there's a kind of a very joyful palette, I would say, in a lot of your work. So, you know, something I've been crit not criticized for, but recognized for an awful lot in the past is very dark photographs. I mean, like mm -hmm. uber dark, um, and that was my melancholy manifest manifesting itself. But it seems you've managed to. On the whole, I mean, I, I'm aware of your black and white work and you talk about high contrast, high impact. But on the whole, I would say that the feel of your images, there's a delicacy to it uh, that's very soothing and very ethereal. Um, and, you know, when, when we're talking about anxiety and the sort of representations of that anxiety, it seems that's an interesting di dichotomy really between two, two approaches to the same thing. Yeah, like hearing you talk about how your work tend, has tended towards darkness. Um, so I was in Death Valley National Park when one of my closest friends passed away very suddenly. And then my father passed away in January and we went to Death Valley National Park right after that. So it's a place that I find a lot of connection to that, that landscape and know it really well. And none of my work from either of those times was dark or angry or like the melancholy. So I, I, don't, under, I don't have a good understanding of why. I can't articulate why. Uh, but I think it may be more, for me, it's more the process is healing versus the output. Like the, the, right. the process isn't necessarily reflected in the results of, my, of that creative process. Right. Whereas for you, it's different. I only get a head scratch going on here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and this, this, I think, is the beauty of creativity in that there's the process of engagement and, and of being absorbed and um, kind of distracted to a certain extent in its own right is therapeutic. But what's really curious there is that what you're coming out with is an aesthetic 
you're you're still so that you, you've got a difference really between the sort of what you might be dealing with emotionally while you're in the landscape versus producing something that's that's very much a a, a kind of calm or ethereal and it, there's still this there's a sort of there's an identity in 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 the product as it were yeah it's it's definitely it's something that i've thought about too because um, I was I was I was hoping that you had because you're you're required to speak now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I don't have a good answer for it. Like I oh. think that my, my best answer is that the it's the process for me that's healing, and it's not the outcome is pretty consistent regardless of how I'm feeling. Like uh, if I'm feeling down one day or frustrated one day, I I, I think it comes out more in the process rather than the results. Um, and do, do you think that's partly because that you're processing the images when you get, I mean, th there, there might be a time lap between the event and when you actually sit down to process the images. And perhaps when you're sat in front of the computer, you're just in a different emotional state. That's possible. Uh, but like for my time in Death Valley, so we literally left my dad's funeral and came home, packed up our Airstream trailer and drove to Death Valley. So it was a very, very short interval. It was a traumatic experience, that whole, the whole process of him passing away. And then arriving in Death Valley, like looking at my work, it's light and bright and cheery and harmonious and like my like gentle color palettes. So it's it, that emotional experience, like I could be standing at my tripod just bawling, feeling like very emotionally distraught. And yet the photos that come back still fit within my general, like the lighter, brighter palette and the kind of like harmonious compositions. Uh, so the process that, that got me to those photos was healing but, and, and um, cathartic, but that, the, that isn't reflected at all in the results. And I know I that's very different from, for a lot of other photographers who feel like if they're going through a period of melancholy, that's very much reflected in their work. And I just haven't seen that. Now that I've had, an, I've had unfortunately, enough experiences right. of dealing with loss and then immediately going into a landscape where it's just like being there is the part that is important to me from a mental health perspective. And then the output looks like like I could be on having my happiest day of photography and the output would look pretty similar. I think that's fascinating. And I don't have a good explanation. <laughs> maybe it's just, maybe I'm not as in touch in terms of my results as some other people are. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, maybe you're just more mentally stable than I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's curious because I think you look at Guy Tal's work as well and Guy... Guy's work doesn't reflect necessarily a lot of angst or melancholy or darkness either. And I, I wonder if just the American West is just a cheerier place than the West of Scotland. <laughs> well, but even when I, like, I had a p particular day a couple of years ago uh, with fall colors uh, here in southwestern Colorado. And the it was super moody. And I processed the photos from that day with a much lighter, brighter feel. So right. I think it's just... Like even if I just am drawn to that look, so I think that it that's just the result that it's not necessarily I just don't feel like my emotional experience of photographing is connected with the results as much as it is for some other people and funnily enough i mean it's uh, I, I I don't necessarily think mine is either i mean i I think when you run a lot of workshops i mean you know, a, a good example was I was in Canada in like 2014 for about six weeks. And then I came back to Scotland and ran a bunch of workshops. Uh, so I think it was about six months before I actually got a chance to sit down and process the images. And what I realized was that I had no real emotional memory of mm -hmm. what it had been like being in the field. Uh, I've been with uh, Adam Gibbs and Paul Siska and, uh, and um, Danny uh, Lafrancois uh, was there as well. And the images I was making had no emotional connection to the experience at all, um, but they were still dark. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right. but do you think that darkness is connected to your aesthetic preferences, or do you think that it's connected to your, like, the emotional 
drivers behind your photography? Or do you think- I, I, I think the key word is, um, is aesthetic preference. Um, I, I, I think I like, I think the, the you, you may be aware, I, I do a lot of videos on the compositional consequences. Mm -hmm. And the, consequen the consequences of certain types of processing are either things are explicit and obvious and more detailed, or they're more mysterious and hidden and require um, investigation to a certain extent. Um, and I think as social media kind of evolved and, and phot photography became a much more transient experience, or the appreciation of photography was more transient, you know, with most images being seen on the internet, uh, I made my images really dark and hidden details in them to force people to engage with them, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think if they're very explicit, then people say, all oh, right, yeah, that's what that is, and then move on. Uh, so I think there was a little bit of gamesmanship involved in that as well. And I, I, I do like, it's funny because I'm a real sunny side up kind of guy generally, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic most of the time, but um, I think that's a veneer. Uh, as well, I, th I think, uh, and uh, you know, to a certain extent, I'm curious about asking you this as well because, you know, I'm, I'm starting to know more about you. You know, we've we've had some conversations over the last month or so, and then obviously you give me a lot of information in in notes and and backup reading for for preparing for this. And how much of your because your work is is what people see of you and mm -hmm. people judge it and they judge you based on your work. Do you think that we are all somewhat guilty of putting up a facade uh, to hide behind? Or do you think we're laying it all bare and, and just saying, well, this is who I am and, you know. I think a couple of years ago, I was absolutely putting up a facade. I think I had, I went through a process of kind of staying off social media and really focusing on introspection for about a year and a half. We had, we were traveling full time in an RV and I just, I had a lot of other things going on and I just didn't feel like I had time to engage with other photographers and an audience as much as I had previously. And I feel like that period of time in my life, like I decided I photograph for me. I do not care what people think. Like, I don't care if you're judging my imagery as being simple or boring or too bright or too colorful or too obvious because it's, it makes me happy. Like, I'm not concerned about my legacy. I'm not concerned about winning awards. I'm not concerned about being popular. I do this because it's a calling, because it's the thing that makes me happiest. It gets me out in nature. It connects me to the things I love and am fascinated with. And that, so I kind of dropped the facade. And it's right. like, if I'm interested in, like some, I just did a, a class recently where I showed a photo of bark. Like I had taken a photo of some bark and somebody's like, what on earth are you ever going to do with a photo of bark? And like, it doesn't matter if, like, I don't care if you don't think this picture of bark is interesting or you don't see a purpose for it because it was something that caught my eye. I was fascinated in the details, was in a particularly interesting location. And like, that's what matters to me. Right. Uh, so my photography is an expression of what I connect with in nature and what fascinates me and promotes curiosity uh, so like that facade, I feel like, like, I just don't care anymore. Right. I mean, th this, this is a common, uh, thematic conversation. I mean, I had a, a very similar conversation with, uh, with Alex Noriega the other day. Um, and funnily enough, Marcel Van Oosten, who's like uber popular. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's massively popular guy, you know, and there, there's always going to be this, uh, juxtaposition between, making a living as a landscape photographer, which relies on a certain extent on a large enough number of people knowing A, who you are, and B, the message that you're trying to promote through the type of images that you make. And, you know, the, the big question these days is, well, can you make a living with quiet work? Uh, now, I spoke to William Neal earlier in the week, and I'm speaking to him again tomorrow, and there's there isn't a man alive who's made quieter work over the last 30 years. So I would say, yes, you can, but you know, the, how do we, how do we overcome this, um, this sort of slight attention grabbing qualities of landscape photography that it has to be dramatic and dynamic? 
Well, I think the first thing is accepting that your audience is nat- naturally going to be smaller. Mm-hmm. Like there, I think there are some people who do some intimate landscapes who have a fairly big audience, but I think like Theo Fossboom, who you spoke with, like, I think he's somebody who, uh, he has a, a fairly sizable audience for the type of work that he does, but I would also consider him, his work fairly quiet and like very introspective. Like he's finding details in nature that most other people would pass by or would think are totally mundane and wouldn't be interesting for a photo. Totally. But he's creating this, incre- what I find to be an incredibly inspiring portfolio. So I think when you look at people, like you can get to a moderately sized audience where it's enough to make a living, uh, like enough people to choose to go on your workshops, to buy your products, to engage with whatever other offerings that you have. Um, so, so the first, my first response would be, yes, it's possible, but that you have to be, I think you have to accept that the, the nature of social media today, which is the main way that people consume photography like that you're never, or it's, it's a rare exception that you gain an audience, a gigantic audience with that type of work, right. but that you don't need a gigantic audience to be successful. And you might be happier without one. Like you might be happier with a more discerning, a smaller audience that really appreciates what you're doing because it's slightly different and it's more nuanced. Well, I don't want to use judgmental words. So I'll back up a little bit on that. <laughs> it's, different. it's different than I think the the things that attract the most attention. Um, So I think it's like some self-confidence is required for that, feeling like you're on the right path and that that you're okay with the fact that you're not going to have a million people following you on Instagram. Right. I mean, this is my point actually, is and and something I've I've come to realize partly through lockdown and and it was I was well on the way down that road already, was was realizing that the benefits of landscape photography in terms of uh, looking at the images as a product, an articulation of something, um, in many respects are less valuable than your engagement with the tree bark. You know, I think I call that sort of engagement with the tree bark as, I mean, that's optimal living as far as I'm concerned. You know, they're the moments that we look back on, on our deathbed and say, yeah, I was really alive then. You know, mm-hmm. I, that that was living for me, and I personally think that that's more important. And and really, the, the the photograph of the tree bark is an illustration of that engagement and the fascination that you have. And I think that's one of the things I super admire about your portfolio and the way you're presenting yourself and the way you're talking about your work now is that you've you've served your time of introspection to a certain extent and you know why you make photographs. Um, Now, do you think that the Cole Thompson approach for you was, was that catalyst that allowed you to truly understand that going down a a particular road may have been more successful, but it wasn't necessarily true to who you are? Uh, Yeah. So, uh, and I can mention briefly what Cole Thompson's approach is. So, he practices something that he calls photographic celibacy, where he doesn't look at a lot of other photography because he feels like it, that it imprints too much on his own vision. So it clouds his mind and his ability to connect with a landscape based on his own vision instead of the catalog of photos that he has in his mind. So uh, I found, I did that not as strictly as Cole does, but generally I did that for about a year and a half. And I found that it, it allowed me the space to get all those other photographs and other ideas out of my mind so that I could really focus on like, what am I really connecting with most when I'm out, when I'm outside, uh, that I don't have a catalog of photos from this place that I'm either trying, consciously trying to avoid or like trying to find or just overthinking and just getting all of that out of my mind so that I could focus on what I was connecting with most. Uh, so for me, I it, but Cole has practiced this for something like 10 years. He just right. had a post about doing this for years and years and years. Whereas for me, I felt like coming into that practice, really spending the time working on myself and my own photos, and then kind of pulling back from it was most appropriate for me. Because I, I really enjoy looking at photography books, and I like mm-hmm. looking at uh, my friend's photography. So 
like for me now, I engage with photography, but if I'm going to a place, I do not look, I do not do any research beyond guidebooks and maps because I don't want that catalog of photos in my mind. No. So for me, I feel like it's kind of a moder- a modified form of what Cole Thompson refers to as photographic celibacy is, has worked really well for me in giving me mental space to find my own voice. Um, going back to what we talked about a little bit earlier in terms of the mental health aspect of that, did you find at the end of that year and a half process that you were uh, more grounded and happier than you were before you went into it? Oh, so, so much happier. <laughs> like, the, I think that I started out with the photography of like seeking external validation. Like that was the motivation, getting people that I admired to give me positive feedback to get a lot, like Nature Photographers Network was one of the prime places where people congregated at the time. So getting positive critiques from people like that, that was what was driving me. Mm -hmm. And then I think taking a step back and saying like, why am I doing this? Like why, what makes me happy? Like, what do I want to say with my work? How can I best reflect myself in my photography? Like taking the time to do that, I think was incredibly valuable and was really positive in terms of my own self-confidence with my photography. Like once I started finding, like letting the internal motivation speak more loudly um, and not caring as much about what, what I was receiving in return, I think that's where, when I started really actually enjoying the, like the process of sharing because I felt like it was, like I'm sharing something that's special to me and I don't, that's enough. Like that's an right. end in and of itself. Right. I mean, I think you're the 12th person I've spoken to since we started Vision and Light, which was just Adam Gibbs and I just shooting the shit, basically. (laughs) Uh, I mean, that's how it started out. It was just Adam and I having a chat. Um, And what's been really beneficial for me out of it, because I think one of the strengths in landscape photography is if you do what's right for you, if you do what feels right and you do things or or you don't do the things that you don't want to do, uh, then you have a more fulfilling and happy life. So I get a lot out of this. And the beauty of speaking to people like yourself is I get so much valor, so much hope for landscape photography, because I was getting very, very disenfranchised with it as an art form because it became about popularity glorifying the landscape um faking it a a lot of fakery going on um and these aren't judgmental terms these are just facts (laughs) you know um and what i felt was is that the process of engaging with the world and taking joy in that was somehow becoming secondary and the thing that you're saying today which is filling me with such joy is that you're just another great ambassador for the goodness that landscape photography can do for two things. One is ourselves and our mental health and our quality of lives and our fitness. But secondly, the principles of nature first, you know, which is the landscape has to be protected. It has to be um, maintained. Would you like to just give us a little bit more background about nature first and how you see that moving forward? What, how, how, how can that gain some more weight? Yeah, uh, I'm thinking like probably like three years ago, about eight or nine Colorado-based photographers got together because I think we were all individually feeling frustration with a lot of the things that you've been talking about. Mm. Like the, the, the photograph is the most important thing. It's not everything that comes before it. So if you damage a place or you draw a lot of people in an irresponsible way to a place, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, you got your photo. And I think just seeing that happen in so many landscapes across the American West um, and seeing the consequences for photographers, like places are being closed and limited and uh, that that's really impacting our ability to do our work in a creative way. Mm. Uh, So that the, there are lots of things feeding into it of like we as a community we need to be more active in advocating better practices so i think that's that's kind of where the idea of nature first came from and then we together created the seven principles which i know you and adam uh, went through uh, for earth day so if people want to refer to that video that's a really good primer of the seven principles um, yes that's very true <laughs> <laughs> um that 
that uh, we as a community can can take these seven pretty easy things and that if you're not practicing them, you probably are part of the problem. Um, and if you are actively promoting them, then you're part of the solution, uh, both to protect landscapes, to be good stewards of nature, and to just keep our access to these really special places open. Um, so I, th I think just generally we work we were motivated by the idea that we as a nature group of nature photographers have the opportunity to be more responsible and better stewards. And that hopefully by promoting some really concrete ways, we can promote some better, um, better practices. So I think it's been encouraging to see how many people have adopted the practices. Mm -hmm. I think the goal for this year is to get to 10,000 members and that right. if we could actually get to 10,000, I'm no longer part of the organizing group, so I shouldn't say we, um, but the efforts goal is 10,000 people. And that if we're all actively promoting the seventh principle, which is sharing about nature first and how we practice it, uh, being evangelists for these right. ideas, that hopefully over time that we could actually have a positive impact on curtailing some of the, the bad or the problematic things that have emerged over the last couple of years. Right. I mean, you know, realistically, 10,000 is a tiny drop in the ocean of yeah. the number of people who are actively out in the landscape with cameras. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I personally want to totally up my game in terms of what I do to, to help spread those, those messages. And this is why I think the, the opportunity with lockdown is to reassess our business practices as a whole. Um, and I think we'll be doing less workshops in the future mm -hmm. just because of that. You know, I, I, I just can't justify some of the stuff that we we did do previously and i don't mean destroying the landscape or stuff but just you know going to popular places and things like that so um yeah i i, I don't know talking to you is giving me a lot of hope for some reason um well that's good to hear <laughs> <laughs> no it's true because you know it's I, I just like i said before i think your work is uh there's a this this sort of overly there's, there's a very ethereal quality to it. it it's almost, even, you know, even your terrestrial work is almost of the air. You know, the, the, there's an atmosphere to it, uh, which is, uh, as you say, very harmonious and, and um, very beautiful to look at. Some One final thing I want to talk about is this podcast that happened uh, this week on Matt Payne, uh, F-Stop Collaborate and Listen. It became very much about uh, female photographers and female landscape photographers and the challenges of being a female landscape photographer. And this isn't something I particularly want to get into, but what I am interested in is can we identify female aesthetics or are certain compositions inherently male? Are, thing, are, are certain subjects the realm of one of the genders only or is it such a broad gamut that we can all dip our toes in whenever we like i think this is such a hard topic to discuss <laughs> because it's it's laden with stereotypes and uh, like turning individuals into a monolithic gender so i always wade into this very carefully because there are very clearly exceptions uh, sure. that some women have very bold styles and uh, choose to have really expand, like presenting very expansive scenes in intense and dramatic ways. Um, and some men have very quiet work um, with, you know, you could uh, stereotype more like a, a softer color palette and things like that, gentler compositions. So I, I don't want to generalize, but I think when you look at, I think one of the reasons that, uh, women might have trouble getting as much recognition is possibly a tendency towards more quiet work. Uh, I don't know that, like when I look at my female friends, I would, my female nature photographer friends, I would say that most of them do have, their work would tend towards being quieter, focusing on smaller scenes, uh, having generally kind of a lighter, brighter, more pastel type of feel uh, that, so that's, those are a bunch of generalizations, but if those generalizations do apply somewhat across the spectrum of women in nature photography, I think that does make it harder to get attention for your work. Uh, like I, I remember a couple of years ago, a judge said, a judge of a major photography contest said something like, 
well, if women, women would win these contests if their work stood out. Right. Well, it's possible that, the, the, our work is just as good. It just isn't as eye catching. Uh, and that, that that's a, a challenge for like, when you think about the spectrum of women in photography, if grabbing attention is part of what makes you visible in this field or brings opportunities or makes it possible to have a career that if your work is generally quieter, it's possibly not as visible or as eye catching uh, like immediately eye catching. Sure. Um, that that could be a challenge, mm-hmm. but I just I just hate the stereotyping that comes along with it. So I clearly like feminine would be a definite identifier you could attach to my work, my color photography. But I don't know if it stems. It's hard to say how much it stems from my gender, how much it stems from societal and cultural influences that are millennia in the making. Sure. Like it's. I don't have a good answer. No, and you know, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that one either, but I think really it was important for me to, to sort of have a, a segue into the fact that part of what I do through my own teaching is to try and break down those barriers. Um, because I think there are many men who are completely incapable of expressing emotions um, or they express them poorly uh, mm-hmm. or, or with a limited vocabulary. Um, and Equally, there, there are women who are reluctant to, uh, like you say, we were talking about facades earlier on. So I think, you know, I, th- I think photography, uh, what I'd love to try and be able to separate is the societal judgment of who we are, what we do, what we look like, our sexuality and uh, our faiths and all of these different, you know, our spirituality and separate all of that from our work. Uh, and basically say, you know, let's let's judge each individual photograph on not not even whether we like it or not, but but the fact that it was somebody's aesthetic choice to make mm-hmm. their work in that way. Um, and I I think that's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of the whole conversation with you. I think it's been very hopeful, um, and I feel hugely energized from having been able to speak to you because I think the thing that's becoming clearer to me having a broader experience now of talking to to numerous people like yourself is that there's a core now of very strong photographers both male and female now who share the same goal which is to cut through all this shit (laughs) and and let's just make art and express ourselves and engage with the planet and look after the planet. So Sarah Marina, I, I'm, I'm just so delighted that you did agree to come on the show and it's been an utter pleasure talking to you this afternoon. Well, thanks so much, Alistair. And I've really loved all of your other interviews. It's so nice to hear conversations that go beyond the surface level about nature photography and connecting with the landscape and really getting into motivations and challenges like mental health and like what a creative process looks like for different people. So the fact that you're really diving into these kind of nebulous and more difficult (laughs) conversations that you never know where they might go, but I think that they're particularly interesting. So I think you're doing a service to the community as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. One final question. What's your favorite lens? My favorite lens, my 100 to 400. (laughs) No, yeah, you need to send the what's in your bag list for for the notes. (laughs) (laughs) The what's in the bag is helpful for affiliate links and that's about it. (laughs) Totally. Uh, So I will... uh, See, thank you very much one more time. Uh, So, Sarah, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Yes, you as well. Thank you, Alistair. Thanks. 